Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste. So here we are continuing the saga of Tripura Rahasya. Uh, the secrets of the goddess of the three worlds. And here, Dattatreya, the guru, has accepted Parasharam as his disciple. And so, this is what Parasharam said after passing the test of his guru. Hearing the words of Dattatreya, the happy Parashuram humbly prostrated and after taking a seat, spoke sweetly to him with folded palms. O eminent guru, O Lord, when you are pleased, what is there that is not attainable here and hereafter? So this is very instructive. This is the etiquette of approaching a guru. One should be prepared to pass the guru's tests. And even if one is presented with an illusion, one should not lose faith. One should not lose hope. One should not lose dedication and devotion to the guru. So this test can be very severe at times. I remember my Adi guru tested me in this way. I won't go into the details, but obviously I passed it. And similarly, Parashuram, you know, now Parashuram has been a, a really hard guy. Thirteen times, or eleven times, something like that, he completely wiped out all the Kshatriyas, all the Kshatriya kings in the whole world. He was unstoppable. He was like a force of nature. He was so powerful because he was benedicted with an ever victorious chopper, an axe. Nobody could stand against him. So anyway, after all this, finally he let go of his desire and anger. And now he's approaching the guru for ultimate liberation. He says, what is there that is not attainable here and hereafter? Just like a person desiring a diamond found a mountain of gems, I have come to a great one like you. So this is the, the feeling, this is the impression on approaching a genuine guru. Typically, one is on a search or a quest, looking for a specific type of knowledge or a specific benediction, a particular spiritual aspiration. But when one encounters the guru, one realizes this aspiration of mine is like nothing. I thought it was so great. I thought it was the ultimate. But this, what the guru is offering me, is beyond anything I could ever have imagined. This, the value of this is like a mountain of gems compared to a single diamond. This is real guru and real disciple. So he goes on. O oh guru, for a long time roaming in the worldly life, I never gained even a little solace. I have spent a long time caught and burnt in the blazing fire of desire and anger. I never felt any inner cool anywhere. In this world, all men, women, animals, creatures of the sea, birds, the wealthy, the poor, kings, emperors, monarchs, Gandharvas, Yakshas, demigods, Siddhas, Vyadharas, serpents, snakes, demons, Indra, moon, and the like are always being burnt by the great fire of desire. 
Therefore make me remain always cool, like the elephant in the middle of the Ganga, while the forest is on fire. O Lord, similarly let me be suitably instructed by you. Now this is very interesting. Coming in the sequence of videos where we were just discussing how the Buddha declared an island in the midst of the furious floods. Huh? He said, let there be an island where there is no desire, no possessions, no clinging, and no action. I term this island Nibbana. So where there's no clinging, where there's no actions, where there's no possessions, there's no desire. See, desirelessness is the key. One has to feel confident that in the protection of my guru, everything I need is coming to me. Everything from my daily necessities up to and including complete salvation, moksha, liberation from the material existence. That no more do I have to worry about myself, no more do I have to take the false shelter of desire. Huh? Why does a person feel they have to desire? Because they're incomplete. They're missing something. They're bereft of something. Either something has been taken away or something is not there. In any case, they're feeling incomplete. And they're also feeling fear that maybe my daily necessities won't be supplied. Maybe I'll have to suffer. Maybe I'll have to go hungry or something like that. But you see, the problem is the origin of this suffering is desire itself. As long as one maintains this desire. That's why in the last video, we were talking about wishless concentration, desireless, uh, without longing, timeless, existing only in the present, not considering any future, either positive or negative and trusting that this simple lack of desire, this simple silence or lack of activity will in and of itself bring the ultimate benefit. To do this, one has to be in yoga. Yoga means linking. Huh? It means a connection, like a yoke, putting a yoke on an ox to draw a cart. So there has to be a connection between the self, however you conceive of this oneself, and the super soul or Brahman. There has to be a connection and that connection is called yoga. And there are four basic types of yoga, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga corresponding to the four states of consciousness. Here goes the chart again. <laughs> the Jagrat state of consciousness where the world appears real. The Swapna state of consciousness where the world seems like a dream, but the reality is not, still not yet understood. The Raja Yoga in the state of Shusurti where it's understood that the world is simply an appearance. And finally, jnana yoga in the state of Turiya, where it's understood that the world never was, unborn, uncreated. So this is the ultimate state. And to attain this state, we approach a realized teacher, a guru, a master, and we beg them, literally beg them, bowing down on the floor, huh? 
there's a type of offering obeisances which is called namaskara, which means nine parts of the body touch the floor, touch the ground. The toes, the knees, the hips, the belly, the chest, the nose, and the forehead. So when the body is displayed like this at the feet of the guru, the guru, of course, feels compassion and feels obligated to offer all help. And still, it's very difficult for the conditioned beings to give up their feeling of possessiveness towards the body and various objects in the world. But this conditioning is exactly what blocks them. Huh? This desire to be associated with worldly things is actually what blocks the light of Brahman and keeps us from realizing the self-effulgent nature of the self. This is who I am. Huh? Brahman, pure consciousness, objectless awareness. Ordinary consciousness always has an object. Even Turiya consciousness has the object of the other three states of consciousness, Sushupti, Svapna, and Jagra. But pure consciousness has no object. That's why it's called objectless awareness, Turiya Tita. This is the ultimate. So by approaching an authentic guru, someone who has already realized this, then one can very easily, I mean comparatively easily, <laughs> be blessed by him and attain this highest state. So this is the etiquette. This is the process. One should approach the guru, introduce oneself, develop a dialogue, and pass the test of the guru. And then, after acceptance, one should remain in a desireless state, realizing that, oh, the guru will take care of everything. Guru will tell me exactly what I need to know. And by serving his lotus feet, by the good karma developed by this service, everything I need will come to me. I don't have to worry about anything, because this is the highest service in the universe, serving the lotus feet of a realized being, Bhagavan. So this is the point of this whole story, that one should, without any desire except for service, one should approach the guru and beg for instruction, and then remain under the guru's care without any desire, in full confidence that all needs, all desires will be satisfied. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shakti Aum.